What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi Shrinks and Sneakers.com. So today I'm going to cover a medication that I think is one of the more commonly prescribed medications. Specifically, if you have either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, you've probably run across this medication before at some point in your treatment. So this medication is called Risperdone or Risperdol. And Risperdone is one of those go-to medications. It's one of those go-to dopamine blocking medications in psychiatry. It's tried and true with a moderate side effect profile. So it actually has pretty good efficacy and a relatively mild or moderate side effect profile in comparison to some of the other medications, namely things like orlanzapine that we've talked about in previous videos. So when you talk about indications for this medication, the FDA approves it for quite a few things. One being schizophrenia, like I said at the beginning, the other being bipolar disorder, and also another interesting and unique one to this medication is irritability associated with autism spectrum disorder. So sometimes when you're in the child adolescent clinic or you're working in a pediatric setting, you might see some kids with autism spectrum disorder on a low dose of risperidone because it helps to deal with the irritability sometimes associated with that disorder. Now, these tabs come as oral disintegrating tablets, so what you do is you put it on your tongue, you let it sit there and disintegrate, and then you swallow it. It doesn't have to be necessarily placed under the tongue like a sublingual tablet has to be. Another good part of this medication, or another reason why this medication is sometimes used, is because it comes in an intramuscular form, and that's called Risperdal Consta. So it's a two-week formulation. And um, it's, it's, it's better than having to remember again to take the medication every day and also it allows for more sustained plasma levels and doesn't allow for all those peaks and troughs that you see with oral medication sometimes. Now for schizophrenia, we're usually going to start our doses about one milligram twice a day. So it would be a total of two milligrams for the day. Uh, once One BID would be another way of putting it. Now you can increase by one to two milligrams per day as recommended. And usually the sweet spot with this medication is somewhere between four to six milligrams per day, depending on the patient and the patient's response. The maximum dose is 16 milligrams per day. You don't usually see people get to 16 milligrams per day because that's where side effects start to become very, very prominent. I would say even when you start to get to nine milligrams per day, side effects become more of an issue with this medication. So there's very little data to support better outcomes above six milligrams. So again, four to six milligrams is your sweet spot. Anything above six milligrams, it's questionable whether there's any benefit and you're also running into worse side effects. It can be given once daily if you want to, if the patient prefers. I always say daily dosing is so much easier to deal with. Even if, if I ever have to take a medication for anything, to take it once a day is much easier than taking it multiple times per day and remembering that throughout the process. So this can really help your patients with uh, adherence to the medication treatment so they don't have to remember to take it multiple times a day. So we haven't talked yet here about the mechanism of action. I haven't said anything about how this works, but if you watch some of my other videos then you might already know a little bit about this. And that is that this is a dopamine blocking medication. Specifically, it's going to block those dopamine D2 receptors, and it's also going to block or antagonize 5-HT2A serotonin receptors. So, and that's generally true of most of the second generation dopamine blocking medications. That's sort of what makes them the quote atypical versus the typical medications, is that extra serotonin blockade there. But the dopamine D2 receptor is the primary way that this medication works. It blocks it. When you're monitoring patients on this medication, you want to be mindful of a few things. Number one, you want to watch lipids. You want to make sure that their cholesterol levels, triglyceride levels, you have a baseline. And then, of course, you're monitoring them as you're treating them so that they don't get out of hand. And if a medication like a statin has to be started, it can be started uh, preemptively rather than once the lipids are out of control. Fasting glucose is another one to be mindful of because remember, all of these drugs have propensity for weight gain and a lot of these medications can also cause some metabolic side effects, some of which can lead to things like dyslipidemia and diabetes. So we want to be watching those things as we're going. We want to watch weight gain and waist circumference. And occasionally what comes up with this medication that's unique, I think, about this one 
is prolactin elevation. I'm not gonna say this is the only one that can cause prolactin elevation, but this is the one that we usually talk about it being a problem in. The medication will likely elevate prolactin levels regardless. And that's because dopamine actually provides what we call tonic inhibition of prolactin release. So prolactin is not released unless, unless the dopamine is blocked, the dopamine blockade is going on. Obviously your body has this natural mechanism to keep that under, under inhibition. And then if you introduce a medication, obviously that's going to start blocking dopamine, then it's going to, it's going to uh, cause prolactin to elevate. So there's gonna be an elevation in prolactin. Now, generally, it's not clinically significant in most cases. So even if the prolactin elevation increases a little bit, people do not develop the side effects or symptoms associated with elevated prolactin. So I wanna stress that most people will have some elevated prolactin level, but it doesn't necessarily produce clinically relevant side effects or problems for that person. But there's always people who do have clinically relevant side effects and symptoms. So the things you wanna look out for are things like sexual side effects, galactorrhea, gynecomastia in men, and amenorrhea in women. So changes in your menstrual cycle in women, breast tissue growth in men, or sexual side effects in general are things you want to be mindful of and could be related to prolactin elevation. So at that point, if someone's having symptoms, what you would do is you would check a prolactin level. And of course, if it's high, you would consider changing the medication. But remember, all these things are uh, pros and cons. I think if someone's having those kind of side effects, we would change the medication in majority of the cases or almost all of the cases, unless the person really had a specific reason why they, that only Risperdal worked for them. So we would make the changes. But again, a lot of times it's not a clinically significant elevation in prolactin. It does not lead to any of those side effects or changes. But we want to be mindful of it and we want our patients to be informed and educated about the risks of these medications. The most common side effect actually is what we call EPS. And EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, now that is the typical things that you see with dopamine blockade. And because Risperdone has the highest affinity for the D2 receptors of the second generation medications, you get more risk for EPS with Risperdone than you do with other atypical dopamine blocking medications. So the two things to, that are kind of unique about the side effects of Risperdal are EPS, increased risk for EPS, kind of similar to the way the first generation medications are, and number two, prolactin elevation. Those are the two main ones to think about. Now, I just wanna sum this up because I said a lot of things that might turn a lot of people off to this medication. Um, I, I don't think people should necessarily be turned off by it unless they experience those side effects, in which cases obviously changing makes sense. But if you haven't tried the medication or you haven't experienced any side effects from it, I don't necessarily think having this new knowledge about this medication should make you want to change the medication or get off of it if it's working for you. So the way I think about Risperdal is that it's a reasonable first line option and it is actually one of the medications I will generally use first line. It's not the only one, but it's one of the ones that I kind of keep on a short list for first line treatment, especially for things like schizophrenia. It has a very good literature base supporting it. The literature base supports not only its efficacy, but its ability to help patients with schizophrenia. So it's good medication overall from that standpoint. The medication does have side effects, and I will stress that all medications have side effects, including the medical medications that you are prescribed. So when you're prescribed medications for hypertension, it has side effects. When you're prescribed medication for diabetes, it has side effects. They all have side effects. So it's really, it's, it's really a balancing act between the benefits somebody is gaining from taking the medication versus the side effects and the negative downsides to using the medication, which you have to weigh out carefully and you have to be informed and know something about these medications to do so. The two points that I made before about the side effects that make this a little different than other meds we've discussed, they would mostly be things like prolactin elevation and EPS, higher risk with Risperdal than other medications. So careful monitoring, correct diagnosis, those are things that are very, very important in choosing the appropriate medication for a patient and, of course, monitoring 
for these specific side effects as well as some of the other changes that might be seen when using these type of medications. With that, I'm going to leave it there. If you guys have questions or comments about Risperdone or Risperdol, I'm happy to answer them in the comment section below. And please like and subscribe to the channel.